Welcome friends, good evening, and we're so thankful that you've joined us for Revelation Today, The Great Reset. My name is Wes Peppers, and I'll be your host throughout this series, and we're gonna have a dynamic study over the next several weeks in, deep, in the deep prophecies of the Bible. And so we just wanna welcome you once again, those that are watching all across the world, we're so glad that you have joined us. And it is thrilling in the times in which we now live to be able to study the Bible in such a way. The book of Revelation, as you will see during this series, is seeming to come alive in the world today. And we're gonna uncover some of the most in-depth prophecies that you have seen, and the Bible is gonna speak to you in a very powerful way. And so we're gonna let the Bible speak during this series. In this series, it is a very Bible-based series, and we're going to get answers to some of the most difficult questions facing our world today. So once again, we want to welcome you. Those that are watching online, we wanna remind you that on the website, you'll be able to download free resources each night. There will be study guides on there for you to study for each night's topic. So go to the website, and you'll be able to download and view those. Also on the website, there is the schedule, and you'll see that schedule right there. So we want to encourage you to check out each night. Make sure you don't miss even one. Well, our speaker for the series is Pastor John Bradshaw. He is the president, director, and speaker of It Is Written Ministries located right here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And that is where we are coming to you from live. He has been on several television programs all around the world. He has spoken and preached the gospel on six continents in more than a hundred Bible study series just like this one. And so he is actually a native from New Zealand. And so you'll love his accent. He's very, very uh, gifted in the area of sharing the Bible and helping others understand Bible prophecy. So Pastor John, I'm just going to invite you to come right on out here now. And we're going to just take a few minutes to get to know Pastor John. And he has, I have some questions that I'm going to ask him this evening. Pastor John, welcome. Thank you very much, Wes. Nice to be here. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Revelation Today, The Great Reset. Great to see you. They are already primed and excited. They've I'm got glad. their Bibles ready. They're ready to study. All right. I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions here. Tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you come from? How did you grow up? Okay, the southern accent. This is a genuine southern accent, you know. Uh, if you look at a map of the world, I'm from about as far south as it gets, originally from New Zealand. You know, man, I've almost been here 30 years in this country. That's amazing. That's almost my entire life. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Almost 30 years. 30 I think years. it's like uh, 28 years this year. I yeah, 28 southern, and a half. I think your southern accent has gotten more and more refined yes, over the years absolutely. Here. So this is the real thing. So originally from New Zealand, now very, very happy in the volunteer state. Uh, grateful to be here. Absolutely. Tell us a little about your family. Oh, what a family. I have one wife, two children. They're all wonderful. Uh, two college-aged kids and a wife who looks like she's college-aged, but she's really not. And actually, yes, I am hoping that got me in her good graces. I genuinely am. There's a, reason, there's a reason you say those things, you know. You have great kids. I enjoy talking to them. They're with them, fabulous. Time with them. One boy, one girl. They could, I couldn't love them more. Now, people saw on the flyer, it is written. Tell yes. us a little bit about it is written. What is it? Well, 65 years ago, a gentleman with a desire to share Jesus more broadly than he was able to decided that he would endeavor at least to utilize, to harness the broadcast reach of television. And so it is written, a, a media ministry was born. And so for 65 years, we've been producing TV programs and conducting programs like these and producing resources and so much, uh, uh, so many other things as well, all to lift up the name of Jesus and encourage people to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. And, and I'm not a prophet and I'm not the son of a prophet, but I do believe time is short for this earth and that everything we see going on around us indicates that. So time to get ready for the return of Jesus. And that's what it is written has been dedicated to for six and a half decades now. And we're located right here in Chattanooga. Yeah, we've been here for seven years. Before this, we were in California, and we got out of there before mm -hmm. California fell off into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so we got out in time. And over the years, well, in fact, in just the last 10 years, 10 plus since I've been with It Is Written, we've been blessed to film television programs from sea to shining sea and uh, all around the world on multiple continents, 
countries like uh, the United States and Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, France, Germany, um, where else? Spain and Italy and India and Moldova, about 26 countries. So if you're watching it as written program, there's a good chance we'll be in some other part of the world. Very exciting. It is written as a very wonderful ministry. So Revelation today, the Great Reset, what exactly can people who are coming expect each night? Okay, you can expect this. That would be the Bible will be open. You can expect this. We'll be looking into the Bible. If you have questions, we're going to endeavor to answer them, and we're going to look at the major themes of the Bible, especially those that speak to where we are in the world today. Uh, what's taking place around us gives rise to very, very many questions. And so we'll, we'll, we, we'll start at the beginning tonight and keep on working through. I hope you won't miss a single night. I hope you will tell somebody else. I hope you'll bring people with you, and I certainly hope and pray you'll be back tomorrow night. We'll be looking at the major themes of the Bible through the lens of Bible prophecy. I'd love to tell you that we're going to cover every last aspect of every last prophecy of the Bible, but time wouldn't allow us to do that. We don't have enough of that. So each night we're going to open the Bible, dig in, and look at subjects that are relevant to you right where you are today and to this world and where this world is going. We are in for a great time. You are in the right place. Amen. Thank you so much. At this time, we're going to have a special music by one of our musicians, and it is written, Scott Michael Bennett. And then following that, Pastor John will come out and give tonight's topic. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
appreciate that greatly. Good evening again, everyone. Oh, come on. Good evening again, everyone. Yeah. Oh, that was okay. That was hearty. That was encouraging. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this over here. They weren't sure. And neither was I. Ah, now I'm sure. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Remember, this is tonight an introduction. This is the beginning. Some people will come on the opening night. They'll say, I'm here to hear about, I don't know, the mark of the beast or Armageddon or some such thing. I'm here to talk about, hear about the rapture. Oh, we'll get to that. But you can't cover everything in the opening night, so I hope you'll listen with a little bit of grace and understand that tonight we're beginning with the beginning and that as we roll forward, we'll start to cover some of those other subjects that you're hoping that we'll be able to check off your, your, the checklist there in your mind. Well, we will always begin by praying. So if you would join me in bowing your head, we will pray and ask for God's blessing. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We are grateful to be in your presence. And we ask that we tonight would hear your voice. Not a single person here tonight came to hear the voice or the words of a human being, a man. But we are here that your spirit might speak to us and guide us in the way that you would have us go. I pray you would assure us. I pray you'd give us confidence, certainty, hope. And as you've spoken so many times before, we ask that you would do so again. Let everything that is done here, said here, sung here, honor you and glorify you. And so we thank you. We ask your blessing and we pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen. We have long looked around our world and wondered where in the world we are headed. We know that this is not our parents' world. It's certainly not our grandparents' world. Things in recent times have been changing, and they've been changing absolutely dramatically. The march of progress has been relentless. I'd love for you to think about this with me. A gentleman named Thomas Edison, bonus points if you can tell me his middle name. Well played. The next question will be a lot harder, I promise you. A gentleman named Thomas Alva Edison in the year 1879, what year did I say? 1879 produced really the first workable light bulb. Edison produced the world's first real workable light bulb. Now, others had developed light bulbs. They just, they just didn't last very long. But Edison, the, wiz the wizard of Menlo Park, they called him, working with a team of individuals, developed something that would actually be useful and workable and long-lasting. I said the year was what? Do you remember? 1879. That was not long ago. Up until that time, it had been a pretty dark sort of a world, a dark kind of a place. But things changed. As I mentioned, I'm so sorry, not our parents' world. Edison did great work. But I want you to think about things. This was 1879. It was not very long ago at all. You know, it was only 100 years or so that this nation was locked in prohibition, and I'm not here to talk about the pros and the cons of that, but things have, have changed an awful lot. And at that time, only, what was the number I read? 35% of Americans had electricity in their homes. As a matter of fact, around 100 years ago, it was even 1930, so less than 100 years ago, more people had radios in their homes than telephones. But things changed, and things changed really, really quickly. Now, very few people remember, actually remember, something that looked a whole lot like this. But we remember this. You had people, it may have been you, you knew folks who had one of these on their wall. And then, and then progress came. I remember the first mobile phone I ever saw. It was in somebody's vehicle, and it was about the size of, of, a, of a, a cinder block. The difference was it was heavier than a cinder block. First one I ever saw. But things continued to change. And then we had, we had, we got all modern and we had flip phones there for a while. That was just a, that was a space age. And now, well, now we're really modern. Now your phone will direct you from one side of the nation to another. Your phone is a, is a, a camera and it contains video editing software and does all kinds of things. 
And we like to think that this progress is really pretty good. I remember my mother's first washing me machine. Wait, the first washing machine I remember my mother having was an agitator washing machine. And she'd take the clothing out and put it through a ringer. I remember my arm going through that ringer one day. <laughs> Not a great day. Now, when my mother was able to graduate to one of these newfangled uh, 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 washing machines and dryers, she just thought all her Christmases had come at once. And that was a great day. But progress has brought a dark side with it. On these smartphones we use, there are apps. Some of them are good. Some of them are useful. Some of them are time-wasting. And a whole lot of them track you absolutely everywhere you go, to the extent that an app developer somewhere has a map with your movements traced out on the map. And we said to ourselves, that's slightly unnerving. And we wonder why it's necessary. And we quiz each other, asking each other where in the world this is really going to go. It was 1831 that a British scientist named Michael Faraday discovered that rotary motion could produce electricity. That was a really big thing. Uh, again, not long ago, your typical home didn't have electricity. We were living in the dark. I I'm wanting you to think about how rapidly things have changed. The Industrial Revolution got kicked into high gear a little over 200 years ago, depending on how you calculate that. So for 5,800 years, humanity lived in a pretty primitive sort of a way. And now every home, of course, has electricity. It might come from a coal-fired plant or a gas-fired plant, or it might come from a hydroelectric power station or even nuclear power or solar power. We got tons of power now. This is a world that has changed and continues to change rapidly. But let's think about that change from a couple of different angles. Not all of it has been good news. Some of that progress has brought a dark side with it. It's great to be able to heat your home in the winter and be able to flip a switch and make something happen, but somewhere else, something is being emitted into the atmosphere that leaves a rather unfortunate footprint. That, that's just how it goes. Few people would rather walk than drive. Henry Ford, of course, he, he revolutionized automobile manufacturing but did not realize that there might be another price to pay for our ease of travel and our day-to-day -day comfort. Things have changed, and it hasn't taken the world in an entirely good direction. And now, for reasons that are still open to debate, and I think it's wisest that I stay away from that, we're dealing with a pandemic, something very small, infinitesimally small, a coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which has killed many, many people and sickened many more. And we're trying to figure out what's actually going on, what's behind it, what's the cause of this. And then we stop and say, just a minute, it's not the first thing like this we've ever seen. In the Dark Ages, there was something called the, 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 the plague. It was a great, great it was a terrible plague, and in some European cities, one-third of the population died, was killed as a result of, of the plague of the Middle Ages. Of course, they did not understand disease like we understand it today. And then a little over 100 years ago, the Spanish flu, which killed 50 million people around the world. And we wrestle with this. We wrestle with this. We like to think that we're getting beyond this and that our scientific know-how has led us to a place where... Well, maybe we don't deal with these sorts of things anymore, but, but we do. The relentless march of progress has brought with it some certain challenges. And we're wondering now how to relate to those challenges. People amassing great wealth, that's good for them, but is that all good? The environment creaking and groaning under a certain strain. Well, there's progress, but, but, but is that all good? We, we're wondering about that. How do we deal with this, this march of progress, and what does, it, what does it suggest to us? You know, there are those who have looked at and reflected on the pandemic that we're going through right now, and they have wondered if this does not call for action on the part of the greater global community. For example, people were thrilled to discover early in the pandemic that fish had returned to the canals in Venice. 
and the skies above New Delhi, India were clear for the first time in no one could really even remember how long. If you've been to one of the great Indian cities, a city like New Delhi, and I've been there, you've looked up into the sky and you've said, I cannot see the sky. But during the pandemic, when things slowed down, where people were locked down, where businesses stopped, where industry paused, people said, things are kind of different. And it caused some to reflect further and to imagine a world that might be, that might be really different. A German engineer and economist, a man named Klaus Schwab, in 1971 formed a group that became known as the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum. They conduct their annual meetings in, frankly, a rather beautiful town, a picturesque, remote Swiss town of Davos in Switzerland. And every year, the influential the rich, the famous, gather together to discuss, well, they say, to discuss global issues. A veritable who's who of individuals show up in Davos every year. People like Bill Gates will turn up, perhaps speak, certainly be an attendant, the Bill Gates of the world. Other notable political figures over the years have included Nelson Mandela, even Yasser Arafat was a guest at the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland. If not for the World Economic Forum, you'd never have heard the, the name Davos. It's, it's just there. Beautiful, but otherwise not especially influential. And that's the place Klaus Schwab and his influential, intellectual, very wealthy in many cases, friends and colleagues and cohorts gather together. And so Klaus Schwab himself, again, I mentioned he's an engineer and an economist, not a political figure. Mr. Schwab has said, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity, listen now, to reflect, to reimagine, and to reset our world. Now, let's not blow this out of proportion. This is not the President of the United States or the Secretary General of the United Nations. It's some German guy. But at the same time, given the circles in which he runs and the people with which he confers, those who gather together and sit at his feet, as it were, this is a fascinating uh, statement. Perhaps, he says, it's time to reset our world. The World Economic Forum has a website called The Great Reset where they talk about their vision for the world. And you find this statement written there. The COVID-19 crisis and the political, economic, and social disruptions it has caused is fundamentally changing the traditional context for decision-making. Goes on to say, the inconsistencies, inadequacies, and contradictions of multiple systems from health and financial to energy and education, are more exposed than ever amidst a global context of concern for lives, livelihoods, and the planet. Leaders find themselves at a historic crossroads, managing short-term pressures against medium and long-term uncertainties. Fascinating. Another quote. The Great Reset Initiative has a set of dimensions to build a new social contract that honors the dignity of every human being. If you were to ask me what that means, I would answer honestly and say, haven't got a clue. I don't. That's ambiguous enough that that could mean absolutely anything, but it's specific enough for both you and me to look at that and say, there are influential people who are planning, at least campaigning, to see this world taken in a whole new direction, to reimagine life as we know it. Now, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe there are some improvements that could be made. Maybe that's not bad. And again, we keep in mind, this is a group. Uh, we shouldn't blow this thing out of proportion. Again, this is not the United Nations calling for this at some big gathering in New York City. But this does have many people wondering. We live in a world where the gap between rich and poor has never been greater. We live in a world where armed conflicts break out with some frequency, where global conflicts 
continue to threaten. That's just true. Is it time for a great reset? And if it is, who gets to decide what that great reset looks like? Now, let's remember that human beings have been trying to fix humanity's problems, the world's problems, for a very long time. My, my question for you would be just how successful have we been at that? Environmentally, politically, socially, economically, I might add to that religiously, Planet Earth is not in especially great shape. It's as though human beings have not really been able to successfully grapple with the challenges that we face. And so I want to announce something to you tonight. It's not a new announcement. It's not something I came up with on my own, but I'm profoundly convinced of this, and I would imagine that many people here tonight would be convinced of this as well. And that is that planet Earth is, in fact, heading for a great reset. There's no doubt it's on its way. I'd encourage you to look at this with me from a biblical perspective. And when you look at it from a biblical perspective, you see two pictures of a perfect earth, two. I'll take you to both of them. The first one, this first perfect earth, is found in the book of Genesis. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. He created for six days, rested on the seventh day. And when God was done with creation, he beheld the works of his hands, and he said, this is very good. For the first five days, he said, good. Got to the end of day six, he said, very good. Everything is complete now. It met God's expectations and specifications. The earth was perfect. But then came sin. It didn't take long. If you open the Bible, you, you, you understand the first page of text is Genesis chapter 1. You don't go too many chapters into the Bible and things have kind of turned to custard. It's seven chapters and You know there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. Starts with a perfect world. God made it by the breath of his mouth. He formed Adam with his own hands. He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And just six chapters later, things are so bad that God has got to blow the whole thing up. He flooded the earth with water and, and, and decided that it's best if he would begin again. So the earth started perfect. It didn't take long until it fell. But... I want you to know that at the end of the rainbow is not a pot of gold, but is that earth remade, reperfected, repurposed, if you like. Looking right towards the end of the Bible, chapter 1188, the Bible writer John wrote, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Three verses later, the Bible says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I like the sound of that. Do you? If you do, you could say amen. amen. That sounds okay. No more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. What you see is that one day there's going to be a great reset. It says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3, there shall be no more what? Tell me. No more curse. That's what the Bible says. Clearly, God is going to hit the reset button. God is going to say enough is enough. He did it before. He did it at the time of the flood. Let's reconfigure this thing. He got to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, that's enough. We've got to reset this little part of the world. He did that. Every now and then, God intervenes and says, let's start this again. But very clearly, from a global perspective, God is going to reset this thing, and earth is going to be made new again. And so I want you to think with me. If, if, if anybody believes that that resetting of the earth, the global reset, is, is, is imminent, going to happen sometime soon, then you would agree with me that between now and then, we're going to see some tremendous changes on planet earth. We're going to see some great upheaval on planet earth. We're going to see major reconfiguring on planet Earth. As a matter of fact, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 speaks of a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, 
even to that same time. Now, you, you, this, this isn't, we didn't gather uh, together here tonight to, 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 to scaremonger or fearmonger. That's not the point. But if you've read the Bible, then you've read about a time of trouble. You've read about the mark of the beast, and you know that associated with that, there'll be a great amount of persecution and a lot of suffering. You've read in Revelation chapter 16 about the, the seven last plagues. People have spoken often about the tribulations that will take place on planet Earth before the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this Earth. The Word of God speaks uh, in Matthew chapter 24 about that same thing Jesus speaking. He said, uh, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Now, Jesus didn't say there's going to be some sin. Jesus didn't say there'll be a few problems here and there. He spoke about an abundance of iniquity. And you can, you can choose to define that word however you want, but basically it means sin. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 7, nation shall rise against nation. We've seen that. Kingdom against kingdom. We've seen that too. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Oh, we've seen that. We are, in fact, living through that. But let's be careful that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves just yet. Let's step back before we get too much into tribulation and trouble and trials and, and beasts and marks and kingdoms and all of these sorts of things. We're going to look more broadly. We want to take a look into the future. And in order to understand the future, we are going to look back. We'll look back and forward at exactly the same time. During these presentations, this Revelation Today, the Great Reset series, we're going to answer challenging questions. We'll do our best to find out where we are, where this world actually is today, and where we are in the stream of time. We're going to find out what in the world the, the big picture actually is. And we're going to understand thoroughly what's going on behind the scenes because that's what a great many people are actually missing. It's easy to see the warning light on the dashboard, what's actually taking place in the engine. You know, if you see a sporting event, maybe a ball game, you see players out there who pitch to near perfection. Some of them, some of them bat well. Mostly the ball is caught. Things typically happen like clockwork. But you know that a bunch of guys didn't just get together and decide to walk out onto Comerica Park or Wrigley Field or Yankee Stadium and, and throw a ball and swing a bat. There's a lot to make this thing come together. There's a lot that makes a big event work. There's a lot, even if it's something as simple as a baseball game, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes with practice and workouts and nutritionists and physical therapists and logistics people and baggage handlers and all of that. You know, the guy who swang the ball, swang the ball. First, he didn't swang anything. And he certainly didn't swang a ball. The guy swung the bat and hit the ball over the green monster, and it was a home run. Uh, uh, that guy, that guy you think got lucky? No, there's an old saying in sports, the more I practice, the luckier I get. You see, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, and it's the same in this world. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. So what's happening? Well, the only book that you can find that actually would tell you what's going on behind the scenes is the Bible. There isn't another book. You may be a fan of a, of a certain philosopher, another writer, a theory, a religion. You may be into all of that. But the fact of the matter is the only book that really enables you to see what's taking place in this world is the Bible. It gives an overview of this world, extends right back to creation and even before creation, and takes us all the way down to the end of time when the earth will, in the words of the Bible, be made new. And so it's imperative that we look into the Word of God and find out what's actually taking place, those things that in reality affect our lives. We see trouble in Afghanistan. Okay, but what's really going on behind the scenes? 
We see terrorism, natural disasters. We see shifting moral sands. We see the economy. I don't know how anybody could possibly believe that the economy that's, that, that's being propped up right now can actually go on safely like this forever and ever. What's the overriding spiritual reality that's underpinning the things that we see in the world today? And so we'll go to the Bible in this introductory presentation. And as we do, we are going to see some, some remarkable things. We're going to look in particular at a tremendous Bible story, a Bible story that provides the, the, the underpinning for all later Bible stories, to be quite honest with you. We look at what somebody once described as the master key to Bible prophecy. And we will try to get an understanding. In fact, we're going to get an understanding of what's taking place in the world. Of course, tonight we can't give you every last detail. That's just not possible. But we'll see behind the scenes and recognize that the great reset that is being promoted and proffered by the great thinkers and people of influence in this world does not go nearly far enough in addressing the challenges we face and in proposing the solutions this planet needs. And so we'll look at some background here before we look into this Bible story in the book of Daniel. Uh, we discover in uh, the book of Daniel that God's people came under attack. God's nation Israel under attack by a heathen power. The kingdom of Babylon was the great powerful kingdom on earth in that time. Israel, very small. Babylon was headquartered well, in Babylon, which was in southern Iraq, just 300 miles away from uh, the sea that you can see there, surrounded by, well, Saudi Arabia to one side, Jordan a little further to the west, Iran right next door. At least that's what we call those nations today. And this is the background to the story that we're about to look at. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 24. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Now, now this is actually, this may be even more fascinating than, than, than we even realize. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained save the poorest sorts of the people of the land. Daniel records it this way, beginning of the, the opening salvo of the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave, again repeating what we read a moment ago, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Again, God's people Israel under attack by a, a heathen nation. These were sun worshipers. These were idolaters. And the people of God who were told by God himself that they were to be the head and not the tail find themselves subjugated by, frankly, what was a great kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. But there are lessons in this for us. When the Apostle Paul wrote his first letter to the church in Corinth, he said, now all these things happened unto them for ensamples or examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the scenario is the people of God under attack. A heathen power, 
uh, not, a, not a power of light, but a power of darkness, is on the offensive. God's people are subjugated. They're enslaved. They're taken captive, prisoners they are. The city is destroyed. The valuables are taken. The worship of the true God is trodden into the dust, and many of God's people are taken down to the city of Babylon. Now, what if we can reflect upon this historical account and wonder if in some way history is not going to repeat down in the close of time. If you are a student of Bible prophecy, you will already have discerned that that is precisely what's going to happen. We are to learn from these old experiences. Now, just file that away. We'll come back to that later in the series of presentations. But for now, let's go ahead and follow through this story of, of Daniel and the attack on Jerusalem and then what unfolds. We read about children in whom were no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, such as had ability in them to stay in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And please notice with me what happens next. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names for he gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar to Hananiah Shadrach Mishael Meshach and to Azariah Abednego now what happened God's people worshiping God God's people attacked by the enemy who took them into captivity essentially abolished their religion as far as that was possible and then began to reprogram them. You read in Daniel chapter 1, they gave them different food to eat, uh, different to what they were accustomed and different to that which actually would have honored God. They wanted them to dishonor God. They educated them in Babylonian schools. Now, the Babylonians were brilliant. They gave us a lot of what we have today, uh, 360 degrees in a circle. That's from Babylon. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. The Babylonians came up with that. They were smart. And Nebuchadnezzar was smart too. He actually wanted to, to, to reprogram their minds altogether. He wanted them to take on new identities. The truth is when you get over a little bit later in the book of Daniel, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar sets up a great image and he tells people, commands everybody to bow down. As far as we know, only four did not. It's unthinkable that there weren't more Hebrews in the crowd that day than Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if there were, clearly they were conditioned to the extent that they went along with the king's reprogramming program. Nebuchadnezzar's name means something like May the God Nabu keep the sun, something like that. Nebuchadnezzar was named in honor of a Babylonian god. And evidently, this is what he was doing with Shadrach, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah. Let's change the way they think. We want them to think like Babylonians. We want them to forget all that, all that creator God stuff. We want them to forget the Hebrew scriptures. We want them to be Babylonian in their orientation and even in their worship. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but as you look at the last great crises coming up on planet Earth, you will discern something very familiar uh, in what I just said. And so this gentleman was endeavoring to establish the superiority of his God or his gods. You know, back in Bible times, if there was a war between one nation and another, typically that was a proxy battle. The point of it was to establish whose God was the greater God, whose God was the most powerful. This was the idea here, you understand. Since the Garden of Eden, we've been seeing that play out. And what we see going on in the world today is simply a continuation of that idea. We are in a spiritual war in the world today. I don't mean Christians against the rest. That's, that's, you, you may choose to term it that way, but that's not exactly what I'm angling at. But the God of heaven who created this world for his honor and his glory has been marginalized largely, forgotten about, 
trampled over and other gods are being erected where memorials to the God of heaven might ought to be. And so soon after he arrived in Babylon, Daniel impressed the king so much that the king brought Daniel and those three friends we read about into the king's inner circle of advisors. They were considered to be among the king's wise men. That was a very big deal. They were captives. They were slaves. But they made up a part of the cadre of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar's wise men. Very important. By the way, there's a lesson there, a lesson for everybody. Daniel and his friends were slaves. They were at the bottom of the heap, and yet they rose to prominence and were honored by the king himself. I would just like to encourage you. It doesn't matter where you start in life. It doesn't matter what your lot is. It doesn't matter what you have to your name. What matters is not where you are, but where you're going. And if you have your hand in the hand of God, then you are really going places. And God is going to elevate you. He is going to bless you. He is going to use you. He will lift you up. That's what God does. That doesn't mean God makes everybody rich and famous. That's certainly not what I'm getting at. But whatever you have right now, understand that the gospel elevates and God lifts people up. So here's the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 1. Word of God says, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, or uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. And so the king gave the commands to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. You understand this, right? In the privacy of his own bedroom, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, woke up. This is probably history's most famous case of amnesia. Couldn't remember what the dream was, asks the wise men. In fact, when the king asks you, he's not asking you, he's telling you. Asks the wise men to tell him what it was he dreamed about. The king said, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. And they said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. Of course, that was easy. You tell us what you dreamed about, we'll make something up. Easy. The king woke up needing desperately, he felt, to know what this dream was. He felt as though the gods communicated with him by dreams. In fact, ancient Babylonian records contain tales or accounts of, of, of dreams from the gods, at least as they saw it. And so the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you will be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. You did not want to be caught where these wise men were caught right now. They didn't have a clue what the king dreamed, but it was their job to tell the king what he dreamed. And, and so, so that's, that's, a, that's a tough thing. Where do people look today to get answers for the problems and the challenges facing them? I, I was fascinated to find this quote from a British publisher. Uh, you know that today it's very popular. I don't mean popular among this gathering, at least I hope not. But for people looking for answers to consult people like uh, fortune tellers and mediums, I mean, this stuff is real and it's popular. There's an ever-increasing amount of people in the world today embracing New Age and embracing uh, uh, paganism, religions like Wicca. And more and more people, and I was quite surprised to learn this, have rediscovered horoscopes to help them understand what's going on in their future. So this is from Pan Macmillan, a British publisher. They produce books and presumably books about hor uh, with horoscopes or of horoscopes. Here's what they wrote. Looking outside of the wellness trend, if one thing's for certain, 
It's that we're living in an age of great uncertainty. Zero hour contracts and impossible to climb onto property ladder. Brexit, Britain remember. Climate change and the throwing around of small phrases such as sixth mass extinction all add to feelings of ambiguity and insecurity in our lives. As humans, we're hardwired to dislike and avoid uncertainty. And it produces acute stress responses. So when we cannot know how our futures will play out, it's understandable that we should turn in ever greater numbers towards astrology for clues. I'm not recommending this, of course. You know I'm not doing that. But listen to the thinking. Because people are living in uncertainty and they want certainty, they're embracing things such as astrology. That's true. We are living in uncertainty. People do want certainty. And as a result, more and more people are veering back to, to star signs in all their, um, well, you decide. The same people went on to say this. Of course, the information our horoscopes proffer, listen, is not steadfast in its accuracy by any means. But astrology does give some sense of control over our lives. So this I'll uh, uh, decipher for you. I'll, interpret, I'll translate it for you. The publisher says, while our astrology books are a bunch of rubbish, while there's nothing true in them, while they're unreliable, what they do offer is some sense of control over our lives. People will read this, they'll speak to a medium, they'll read the tea leaves, however they do it, and say, ah, I'm making sense of what's going on around me. This helps. Horoscopes won't help. They don't help. They've never helped. But the philosophy behind this is fascinating to me, giving people some sense of control over their lives. Of course, that's what many people want. Now, what I'm hopeful you will see is as we, as we journey ever closer to the great reset that God is going to implement and the great earthly reset that is going to come, we'll learn more and more about that in coming presentations. As we get closer to both of them, my hope is that we will see that there is one way to get some sort of sense of control about your life, and that's to understand that God is in control. And what we look at tonight will demonstrate to you beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is in control. He's got this. If your faith is in God, then you can face the future with absolute confidence. Uh, the, the, the zodiac signs and the star signs, good for nothing. The Bible, oh, Good for everything. If you're not convinced about that yet, then hang in there with me. T take time to read it. Get the study materials that we're going to give you each night. Read through them and then talk to God and say, God, is it right that the Bible provides me with guidance, the guidance that I need? I believe you'll find that the answer to that question is yes. Now, the wise men, magicians and astrologers and so forth, the scholars tell us that they were experts in something called ecstasy. So they would read the future by taking the internal organs of animals. It already sounds like fun, doesn't it? And looking at them for patterns and for blemishes and inconsistencies. So I guess consistencies and inconsistencies. And they would look at the, the offal, the internal organs of animals, and, and deduce this means that. Because it says this, that is going to happen. Fascinating. Uh, probably not the best way to read the future, but that's the sort of thing these guys did. So they said to the king, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. In other words, we don't have a clue. The king answered and said, I know for a fact that you are buying time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you've agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. I'll know whether you're legit or not 
by what you tell me. You'll say the right thing. I'll remember the dream you live. If that doesn't happen, then you die. They said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It's a difficult thing that the king requests, and there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. That was the truth. The phonies were saying, the only one who can do what you're asking is God. They may not have worded it so, but that's precisely what they meant, and it was true. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious, and he gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And of course, the challenge we have from the biblical perspective is not only would that have been a, a terrible tragedy for the individuals and their families, but Daniel and his three friends were considered to be among the king's wise men. When the king said, kill him, he meant kill Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as well, even though they were not there with the phony fraudulent wise men. Daniel did a wise thing. The Bible says Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They got together and they, they, they prayed. Simple. They got together and prayed. They got on their knees, I'm guessing, and prayed. They, they talked to God. They must have said something like, we're in a jam here and only you can get us out of it. And you got to do your thing as God because we, we don't know. They prayed. Have you ever been in a tough place and prayed? The answer is yes. Have you ever been in a tough place and prayed and seen God do something great? And of course, the challenge for us is that God doesn't always cure grandma's cancer. That's, that's a challenge. That's when people say, why did God let grandma die? Actually, one night in the near future, we'll talk about that. A very thing. But God steps in and intervenes in response to prayer. If I had time, and I don't, but if I had time, I would tell you about the time I was in Africa. And we were holding outdoor meetings, hundreds and hundreds of people coming in Western Kenya. And the children in the home in which I was staying, they said, Pastor, we, we cannot meet this afternoon because it's going to rain. No, they didn't look online. They, they didn't have a newspaper. I said, how do you know? They, they pointed outside. They said, well, just look outside. You, it's going to rain. I looked outside. I said, I don't see any rain. They looked at me like, like I was a foreigner. It's going to rain, Pastor. It must rain. I said, it's not going to rain. Well, they didn't believe that. I said, let's pray. We have to meet today. The people have to hear the gospel. We have to meet. So we had them kneel down in the living room, and, 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 and we prayed, and I was praying two prayers. One, Lord, please keep the rain away. And the other prayer was, you know what, Lord? I've dived in the deep end here, and I've told them that you can prevent the rain from coming, and they know it's going to rain. We need a miracle. Thankfully, God heard both prayers. We walked off to the meetings that day. We were outside. The kids were sitting in the crowd watching me, and they'd look up, and they'd look at me, and they'd look up, and I'd smile while the translator was speaking. I'd nod my head. I'd point to the sky. The rain never came. While we were sitting there, around us, 360 degrees, dark clouds. It was pouring. You could see the rain in the distance. No rain on us. They rushed to me after the presentation. They said, Pastor, I, it's going to rain now, right? As though now I was in control of the weather. And I said, I said, no, it's not going to rain. What? They looked around. You're crazy. I said, no, the people have to have the Bible classes, the Bible study classes. When they were done, the kids ran to me again. It's going to rain now. I said, not yet. They couldn't believe this. I said, the people have to get home. Once they get home, it will rain. You know, I said the wrong thing. I should have said, we have to get home. <laughs> Once we get home, it'll rain. The people coming lived a whole lot closer than we did. So by the time they got home, we were only a quarter of the way home. And it rained and rained and rained. I'd never been so happy in my life to get wet. 
God answers prayer. Can you say amen? Yeah. If I had time, I would tell you that story. I don't have time, so I'm not going to tell you. Boy, is God good. God is always good. You don't always understand it, but God is always good. So I want to encourage you to pray and know that great things happen when you pray. God will do things in answer to prayer that he wouldn't do if you didn't ask. So ask. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. If you don't ask, then you don't receive. And so we consider this great God who answers prayer. He's so far away. How far is heaven? I don't know. The sun is 93 million miles away. The universe is vast. You know, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. That means if at creation, Adam started traveling at the speed of light, he would only be 1 18th of the way across the Milky Way. And the Milky Way, they tell us, is only one of billions of galaxies. Vast a universe we're in. But in spite of that, God in his goodness will answer your prayer. He hears from heaven and he comes close. That's what God does. All right, so Daniel received an answer from God. Daniel 2.19 says, Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And now he's in, in the, he's in the presence of this mighty monarch, and he says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, clay, bronze, silver, gold were crushed together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now, we, I love that, we, that's God and I, will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You can imagine Nebuchadnezzar's jaw dropping. That's exactly what I dreamed. But Daniel was only half done. He had to explain the dream, and that's where it gets interesting for us. The Bible is clear, and it becomes very clear as we look now at the interpretation of this dream. You, O king, are a king of kings. The God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he's given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. And he said to Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, an idol worshiper, was given a vision of an idol. The idol's head was made out of gold, and Daniel explained, King, that's you. What you're going to find is that in eight verses... Daniel traces two and a half thousand years of human history and beyond. And he begins by telling Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon from 605 B.C. to 331 B.C. Babylon ruled. 331, 605 to 538, I got a kingdom ahead. Great and a mighty kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. This is important. I know even after we're done, you might say to yourself, I'm not seeing, well, you will, you'll see. You'll see, this is important. This is the foundation that we've got to understand. Mighty kingdom, bigger than Athens, bigger than Rome, the city, the city. The altar and the throne were made out of solid gold, tons of gold. I looked up tonight to check how many tons of gold, because I was told about seven and a half tons of gold. What I found is that it was more than that. So I'm not going to share that with you because it might be a mistake. I mean, it was a lot of gold. But at the least, tons and tons of gold. Mighty kingdom, mighty. Nebuchadnezzar wrote, and this was found in the ruins of Babylon, the whole earth was prostrate at Babylon's feet. Babylon, the city which is the delight of my eyes, which I have glorified, he wrote, may it last forever. But it didn't. After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. This was Medo-Persia, 538 to 331 B.C. The Medes and the Persians, two powers that joined together, a little bit like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, two powers. That's the second kingdom. And then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. This was Greece, 
which under Alexander the Great conquered basically the then known world. Big kingdom, powerful kingdom. The king is listening to this. He's saying, well, far out. This is what's going on. By the way, Daniel could have got himself killed because he said to the king, your kingdom is going to pass away. You don't say that to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel did. Daniel got away with it. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece then, Rome, from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D., a great and a mighty kingdom to this day still very much influences the world. But that's not all. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay or ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. That's fascinating. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just like iron doesn't mix with clay. Did that happen? Yes, it happened. They used to call Queen Victoria the grandmother of Europe. Oh, I've got to tell you this first. Victoria can wait. They will not cleave one to another. But over the years, rulers rose and fell who tried to cause Europe to reform in one block. It's what Hitler was trying to do. It's what Joseph Stalin was trying to do. If you've ever wondered about what Napoleon was up to, go to Paris and see the great monuments to Napoleon who was try to reunite that same European empire into one block again. Didn't work. Queen Victoria was called the grandmother of Europe. There was a Danish king who, who between Victoria and the Danish king, they had, they, had, uh, they had eight thrones represented around Europe. The marriages were strategic. There was an endeavor to bring this thing back together again. You know why it didn't work? Because God said... They will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not cleave one to another. And what do you see today in Europe? Well, a little chaos, frankly. Brexit, some economies strong, some profoundly weak. Uh, they've not been able to hold it together. That's not to say there won't be future changes. But so far, God is batting a thousand when he talks about these nations and kingdoms and when he speaks about what's going to take place in the future. It's important that we understand that. And so we say, where are we heading? Well, people and corporations are amassing not only great wealth, but enormous influence. Where's that heading? You don't have to be an environmentalist to be concerned about what's going on around you. Just visit Alaska and see the pictures of what the glaciers used to look like. Now, whether this thing is temporary or, or, or long-term, I mean, you decide. I'm simply saying that what you see is undeniable. There are some changes taking place around us. But what's important about this is that the political and economic and environmental challenges that are facing the world are galvanizing the world and setting us on a certain course. Every government's talking about global warming and the need to change the planet and save the planet. Okay, that's one thing. But what's going on behind the scenes, and where is that really going to lead us from a biblical perspective? The global economy is so intertwined that when a cargo ship gets stuck in a canal, supply chains around the world are disrupted, prices increase, and there is chaos in the marketplace. Nations around the world are struggling with this pandemic, and people are divided, of course, about what to do about it. Does anyone really think this won't impact the way the world acts going forward? Now, again, forgive me, I'm, I'm not getting political, and, and so if your politics are one way or another, please don't, uh, don't vent at me, but I, I just want to say this. 
we've got mandates and government influence and peer pressure. In the book of Revelation, you see that very scenario playing out but connected to another issue. It seems as though the world now is being conditioned for the great crisis the Bible speaks about happening. So what we can draw from this. What's going on in the world right now is a conditioning. Again, I'm not speaking to the issues. You can see them one way or another, that's okay. But there is a conditioning going on because when you look at the Bible and speak about Earth's last days, there is a major crisis that's going to involve everybody and there's no escaping. Now let's go back and complete the great prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left. By the way, this is the good news. The kingdom will not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand. You tell me how long? Forever. Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. He says, the dream is what? certain and its interpretation is so as we look forward we understand that the best way forward is to be confident in the God who has a perfect plan friend thousands of years ago God outlined this thing and he said down here in the end of time when you're looking around wondering what's going to drop next you can look up and know that God's hand is on the steering wheel you don't need to consult people and philosophers and books and, and, and whatever else when you can consult the Word of God. You may not know what tomorrow is going to bring, but you know that when you get to tomorrow, God is going to be there, and, and He'll be with you in the very midst of that thing. So we see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Then Rome divides, and according to the Bible, then God sets up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Just so you know, those four kingdoms are gone, but Rome has divided. God said there'd be ten nations. Uh, we'll find out later on that of the ten, three have ceased to exist. That was prophesied as well. And God said, in the days of these kings, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to press the reset button. Talk about a great reset. Oh, it's coming soon. God wants you to be part of it. We're going to find that people, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, well-meaning people are seeking earthly solutions to the great problems confronting us today. But there are no earthly solutions. You can't pay down that debt you're not going to clean up the pollution. Frankly, there are interests who don't want to see it cleaned up. We're not going to get the politicians to love each other and sing Kumbaya. That's not going to happen. You're not going to have all the, what, what, what you may deem questionable morality. You're not going to see that disappear out of the earth. Criminals are not going to get rid of their guns. Terrorists are not going to take the week off. It's not going to happen. So we can seek for earthly solutions. We can we can get the wealthy and the influential and the famous and, the, and, and the, the, the weighty to comment and opine. But the way forward for planet Earth has already been delineated for us. And God has said that faith in his word is the reliable way forward. What God showed us would happen has happened. You can trust him. You can trust him. I read a fascinating story recently. Or maybe it was 25 years ago. I could be remembering wrong. A little boy was abducted, a little Chinese boy, taken from his home. The thought was he was taken by human traffickers. The police began to investigate. They never could find the boy or find who was responsible. And so the dad began to investigate. 
This is in China. He traveled 310,000 miles tracking down leads. He wore out 10 little motorcycles. He asked questions, visited places, spent all the money he could possibly spend. And miraculously, those 25 years later, he came face to face with this boy. His mother said, you're back. My son, you're alive. Can you imagine that reunion? Imagine the tragedy. But imagine the reunion. I wonder if you look into the Bible, if you don't see a world having been abducted, having been snatched away by an enemy, having been trafficked, basically. But you know, it's in the story of the Good Shepherd. Jesus came to this world to buy back, to win back, to draw back that world, that lost world. And what he says is things, you may not understand everything, you may not be able to make sense out of everything in your life, in your community, in this world, but God's got it figured out. And he's going to set up a kingdom one day soon that will never pass away. The world will be restored to its perfection. There'll be a, there'll be a great reset. And God wants you to be part of that. Jesus is coming back soon. And having the, having the Bible in our possession, having Scripture at our fingertips, having the promises right here in full view, having the evidence that God's hand traced history even ahead of time, you know then that what's not yet fulfilled in that prophecy will be fulfilled and one day soon. The dream is certain, God said. And the interpretation is sure. Now, tonight we just began. We, we, we just began. We are scratching the surface, that's all. But we'll be back to study more tomorrow night and then the next night. And you'll have a schedule of every night we're going to be here, and I'm hoping you'll be there because you've seen already the Bible's reliable. If I can trust it, man, I've got to hear more about this and then find out what God will say about these questions that I have tucked away in the back of my mind. The best is yet to come. There's going to be a great reset and tonight, God invites us to be part of that, not to miss it, and to enjoy eternity, which stretches before us. One day soon, we'll be able to step into that eternity. I'm about ready for it. What about you? I think we might be just about ready. Why don't we pray tonight together? We'll close with prayer. We'll ask God to keep us and prepare us for the wonderful days that are ahead. I wonder if you would pray with me right now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the certainty of your word. We thank you tonight. The dream is certain. The interpretation sure. Oh, we live in a challenged world. Yes, we do. But we would ask you tonight, Lord, to keep us and to keep us focused. I don't know if there is a one of us here tonight who can solve the challenges confronting us, but we do believe you've got it all worked out. So, Father, as we go, go with us, and then, Lord, bring us back. We're going to continue to open the Bible, and we'll be listening for the sound of your voice, and we'll be looking for your leading and your direction. We love you. We thank you. We ask your blessing now. Keep us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen and amen. Thanks so much for being here. God bless you. From me, good night. How many found that to be a blessing tonight? You know, a number of years ago, I was an atheist.